I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Yes, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. On this Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Sunday, I'm disheartened by the state of our world and also encouraged by the people that are working to fix it. In his Nobel Peace Address in 1964, he wrote, the deep rumbling of discontent that we hear today is the thunder of the disinherited masses rising from dungeons of oppression to the bright hills of freedom and one majestic, majestic chorus, the rising masses singing in the words of our freedom song, ain't gonna let nobody turn us round. Yeah. I was born a child of the civil rights movement. By age eight, I had gone to more marches than many people will go to their, in their lifetime. I grew up with the understanding that I could never stop fighting for the freedom of all people. My little lungs would fill with air as I sang, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. I knew even then, at that age, that there were people, powerful people, who wanted to do just that. They wanted us to stay the disinherited masses. They wanted to turn us back, all of us, every hue and shade, every gender, every socioeconomic group. They wanted us to be quiet and go with the flow. They wanted us to be complicit in the ugliness of hate. I understood that the only way to gain my freedom was to put in the work of fighting the oppression of all of us. Dr. King also proclaimed, oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself. And I learned this lesson in Tallahassee, Florida in a second grade public school classroom. I was told by the teacher to leave the, leave the classroom every day for the first few months of my second grade year because I was black and female. My teacher found no value in any of those traits. I would tell everyone outside how great we were and that she couldn't see it and we weren't bad. She was wrong. What she was doing was wrong. See, because I wasn't the only one that she was putting out. So I organized games for us to play to take our minds off of it as we baked in the hot Florida sun. I vividly remember trying to tell the kids outside with me that all of us, black or brown or poor or female, that we could make this stop if we just stood up to her. If we told her no, when she sent us outside and we just stayed in our seats. Of course, these children had not been to any strategic organizing meetings, so they didn't understand the good power of a sit-in. They left every day and every day I left. I knew that there was value in staying together. Together, we were united. And unity is what would get us out of this mess. One day I decided that the next adult that asked us why we were outside, I would tell the truth to them. I would tell the truth as I knew it to be. Mostly before then, we would all just shrug our shoulders and, and mumble and say, we didn't know. The adult would tell us to Try to behave better next time. Talking to my classmates about 
why they thought we were outside revealed to me that they really didn't know. They hadn't had the childhood I had and they didn't have the direct experience of being discriminated against, to tell the truth. I knew my voice had to be heard. I was afraid, but I wasn't gonna let nobody turn me around. So that day came, it was a beautiful Florida day. We were all out there, the dirty white boy that we shared our lunch with because he was always hungry and never got to school in time for breakfast. The redhead with the clothes that didn't fit right and the shoes that were way too big. Me and the other black girls, we were all sitting on the wall the counselor came up and asked why we were there. I took a breath. I stood up and I declared that we were there because we were poor and dirty and girls and black and that the teacher didn't like us. So every day she put us out. He looked stunned. And then he looked to the other kids to confirm my story. They all did. He then took us into his office. We never did get the education that we were entitled to. We were given our own classroom in the counselor's office. However, we did learn a lesson that day. We learned that our raised voices had power. We learned that our unity made us stronger. And at the end of the year, that teacher retired. I often find myself thinking of the children left behind in that classroom. I think of how they also learned a lesson. They learned about segregation and about the value that some people place on whiteness. I had a friend who was left behind in that classroom. He was white. He was middle class and he never said a word to me about what was happening. We played together after school, each of us keenly aware that the teacher valued one of us and didn't value the other. Over the years, I've wondered if he wanted to say something but was afraid or if he noticed at all. Have you been in a situation like this where you know you should speak, but you can't find the words. I have. I have felt the hot sting of shame run through my body as the ugliness in front of me plays out and I don't intervene. In my head, of course, I have words, but at the moment, nothing comes out. I have trepidation. I have a desire to keep the peace, to not rock the boat. And afterward, I feel guilt and anger at myself. I feel complicit in the act of injustice because I have been, I have let someone turn me around. Lately, lately it feels like we're at a great turning point in Unitarian Universalism and in our world. Some of us are my friend sitting in the classroom and some of us are the children outside. We have seen the effects of how white supremacy has been lived in each Unitarian Universalism and all of our nations. In the US, we are currently holding our breaths and issuing a warning to our brick and mortar congregations at the threat of violence in our cities and churches because of, because of what our churches profess to believe. Yet, inside of our churches, we are still learning how to separate ourselves from the same white supremacy. In our churches, White supremacy may not be climbing in the chancel and setting fire to the pulpit. 
but it's speaking in our connection groups and in our coffee hour about why our freedom of thought, our freedom of faith, and our freedom of speech is being obstructed by the focus on undoing white supremacy. Either way, it leaves some of us outside of the door, some of us inside. Dr. King stated that with patient and firm determination, we will press on until every valley of despair is exalted to new peaks of hope, until every mountain, until every valley of despair is exalted to new peaks of hope, until every mountain of pride and, and irrationality is made low by the leveling process of humility and compassion until the rough places of injustice are transformed into a smooth plane of equality of opportunity and until the crooked places of prejudice are transformed by the straightening process of bright-eyed wisdom. I want to know if you will commit to working on the side of justice, if you will commit to being on the side of love. And if you will commit to opening the door, opening it wide and making sure there is a seat for everyone in the room. That is the only way we move forward. That is the only way that we won't be turned around. 